Thanks for checking out today's message. We highly encourage that you check out ignitechurch.tv and let us know what God's doing in your life. Share your story with us. Uh, we, we, we believe that God's doing incredible things in your life and we wanna know about that. Now today you're getting ready to hear a message from Pastor Heath uh, entitled from our new series, How to Make America Great Again. Now in this series, it's not all about politics and what you might think, but actually Pastor Heath is gonna let us know what the Bible has to say at, that we as Christians have certain responsibilities to live out and that's how we make our country great again. Enjoy. Today we're starting this uh, brand new series called How to Make America Great Again. Um, this, for everybody that thinks this is going to be a political uh, toned message series, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, it's not going to be that way. The only thing I will chime in and get all the political stuff out of me as much as I can right now, I have, well, first of all, I do have opinions. I have very strong ones, and, uh, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it later, but if you want to know my opinions. But it, from this stage, this stage is reserved for Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And so that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about. I will say that we have a very important election. I think that every election in our country is uh, important, whether it's everything from your city ones and your school boards and stuff like that to this presidential one. And it's, it's getting a lot of um, exposure, a lot of hype, a lot of, you know, typical political junk. And here's what I will say that everybody... I'm not one of these guys that will sit there and say, I think everybody should go out and vote. Um, hear me out on this one. Uh, is it our right? I believe absolutely it's your right to vote. I think too many people are voting, though, because uh, uh, it's dangerous. A, a vote's a very important thing, and you do have a right to that. But whenever you have a right, responsibilities come along with those rights, too. And so I just encourage all of you, if you're going to you register and you have the ability to vote, regardless of what it's on, Inform yourself. Uh, make, an, make an educational uh, contribution, um, a conscious contribution um, to our communities. If we have that ability and that freedom here in this country, um, then we have the responsibility and the way that we can contribute is an educated vote. And so I think a lot of more people um, need to read, you know, you, you understand. A good place to start would be a great history book. Uh, American history would be great. Understand how how things work, how the uh, voting process works, and, and uh, understand what the... Anyways, you need to read a book, is what a lot of you need to. Uh, a lot of history, because uh, there's, there's nothing... Everybody's got an opinion on everything. I'm not talking about political, I'm just talking about life. But most people that chime in in life in this day and age of social media, they're so ignorant. Um, a lot of people just are, are chiming in on stuff that they have no education about, that no facts on, nothing like that, and just like, it, it's like waking up and saying, oh, you know, I feel like starting a fight, so I'm just going to go out and, and scream in the middle of Chuck E. Cheese fire or something like that, you know, and it turns into chaos, and you're, you know, at the end of the day, you just kind of look like an idiot. Um, so anyways, all the political stuff. What I will say, uh, we've had a, an interesting week around here. We, me and my wife, we did something I, I feel like was very American this week. Um, we went to a Toby Keith concert, and uh, <laughs> it was, it was uh, funny, but one thing that I thought we, you know, we were way up in the top, because honestly, I'm not one of those people that really like to be in the middle of crowds, and so we had our little seats little perched up there, and, and uh place was packed, well over 10,000 people in there, and I, I kind of, it kind of hit me in the middle of it. He does this uh, song called uh, Red Solo Cup, and the uh, place goes nuts. I didn't, I didn't know where did all these red cups come from. And, uh, boy, you know, all the, you know, all the, the redneck deplorables, they're uh, lifting up glasses and stuff. And, sorry, I'm going to stop. And, uh, and, but I just thought, this is interesting how... Uh, crazy will go over a song and then you'll get into a place of worship and we're, we're really reserved sometimes. And, but, but we'll say, oh, well, that's just not me. No, I, I saw you. I've seen you at the football games. I see you uh, guys yelling like um, crazed, like you have rabies at your TV um, whenever your team's losing. 
Um, I, I see you get emotional and crazy at concerts and stuff like that. I just believe that um, there's a big difference between somebody that wrote a song and somebody that defeated death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. And uh, so I, I feel like, I don't know, yeah, yeah, I feel like that. Today's message is going to be very, this whole series, if you'll give it a chance, it'll, and you'll come into it with an open heart and, and believe that God has something. I believe we should come in the house of God expecting God to do something in our lives. And so if you're expecting something like that, I believe that this series will deeply um, impact your life and uh, realize that we are called by God to do certain things and lead the way. And I believe the church should no longer ever, it should have never been, and it shouldn't continue to be weak, timid, or passive. It should lead the way um, in making our communities great and our country great and our families great and our schools. And all, we should be leading the way. We shouldn't, uh, we should walk with the authority and power like, kind of, you know, just walk around like you have the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, living within you. And if you would act like you had that, and we had that and collectively as a church, we could sure change a lot of things. And uh, we could sure, uh, if we just follow Jesus and do what he says, then, then lots of stuff will change. And so here's what I'm going to do. This one today, this message today, it's deeply personal. I'll get emotional at some point probably. It didn't work out real well the first experience. I said, I'm going to get through this. And I, and I cried. And it's, it'll probably happen again today. But I'm just going to give you um, some stats right now. Just stats. Since 1973, there was a profound court case that happened in 73 um, that affected uh, some people to the tune of since 1973, 59,450,021, this was as of like, I checked it at, at like 7.45 this morning, 59,450,021 abortions in the U.S. have taken a place alone. So every, of those almost 60 million, every single one of them would be the age of 43 or younger right now. To put that in a little bit of perspective, that would be the 24th most populous country on the planet, right under Italy. But don't worry about that. Soon, in December, it should become, uh, it'll overtake Italy. Um, Italy will, will, will fall behind, and so it's just gaining. And it's, it's crazy. And people could say whatever they want, and you can, we can share difference of opinions in this country but as followers of Christ, we must believe and never apologize for place and value on the sanctity of life, ever. Period, the end, there's just really, uh, the fact that it's a debate blows my mind and you say, well, you're not for women. No, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm for women and women's rights and all, great, fantastic. Um, but we believe as followers of Christ that life is precious and life is valuable. And life is never disposable. It doesn't matter how inconvenient or how upsetting. And I'm going to dive in to some of this. And uh, we're just going to look at the words of Jesus. And we're going to see what Scripture has to say. And that stat right there is alone is bad enough. But in the United States right now, there are over 400,000 kids in the foster care system, if you don't know what the foster care system is, it's a really politically correct term for orphans. 400,000. Now there's good news about that. Well, it, it, just in the two counties up here that kind of split through Joplin and stuff, I think there's something a little over like 600 kids yeah, right in our backyard. But the good news, that, that number sounds... Uh, crazy and, and insane. But the good news is, is that number is only a, a small fragment or fraction of the amount of Christians that are in this country. And so uh, we're called to exactly to, ha to live how Jesus has told us to live. And we're going to look at that way today. And we don't need to sit back and wait for bureaucracies 
or systems or red tape or anything like that to do what Jesus has called us to do. And so we're going to, here's what you need to know about all those kids needing homes. They literally need homes. I'm going to get into a personal story in a little bit, but uh, the church, the local church, the bride of Christ is God's plan A through Z for these kids. It's the solution. It is the solution. It's not legislation. It's not anything. It's the church. It's God's plan for these needy kids without families. James 1.27. Oh, if you haven't figured out, today you'll, be un, uh, you'll, be, you'll just be made uncomfortable at some point. Um, so... James 1.27 says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father. So if you want to know how God looks at what's pure and genuine. means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. And refusing to let this world corrupt you. How many people know that this world will corrupt you? I mean, it's just nuts. It's at some point, you have to look um, at the world around and go, am, are, am I seriously a part of this? Am I seriously, uh, is this is what it's become? This is what, be- the world, if you allow it, will corrupt you. But God, God says, hey, this is what's pure and genuine. Those people that refuse to let the world corrupt them. And that care for the orphans and the widows in their distress. Caring for those that are in need is very close to the heart of God. And I think the reason that we have an issue at all with it in this country, now there's a lot of different reasons, but here's, I think, one of the things that kind of keep us from solving it very quickly is I just rattled off to you a bunch of numbers. And there's not Sarah McLaughlin commercials for children. Sure are for puppies. The reason is, is that we'll associate these kids and say, oh, that's a horrible problem. But I, I promise you, is right now, the only reason that it kind of doesn't affect us very deeply is because uh, it's just a number. And, but if I, if I got up here this morning and I would tell you about this little girl uh, Sophia, who's three years old, whose dad is incarcerated for a, a rap sheet a mile long, and whose mother is so drug addicted that she's been to the hospital eight times in the last year. And you see Sophia that literally has no other family because Sophia's uh, grandparents have disowned her parents a long time ago for the actions of them. And, and so anyways, you're left with little uh, brown-haired, brown-eyed Sophia with tears coming down her face. I, I was literally showing you a picture, tears coming down her face, holding her little teddy bear. And I told you that she didn't have a mom and dad that could help take care of her. See, I, I would put a name with it, a face with it, and a story behind it. If you have those three things, a name, a face, and a story, it changes everything. Now, I'll, I'll guarantee you that most people in this room would go, that is incredibly awful. How can I help? How could I, can, I can help in some sort of way. And we would be moved to action because we had a, a name, a face, and a story. And maybe that's why we're, we're, we're heading in droves to the animal shelters. Now, I'm not, I speak nothing against that. I think it's great what everybody's out there doing, you know. Take care of the puppies and the kitties and, you know, bunny rabbits and all that kind of stuff. It's, but we see their little pictures. We're really good about telling stories. Oh, meat. Meet Fido. 
you know, is, I don't know, he ended up on somebody's porch and he's got a collar that looks like a bone and isn't he cute and he needs your help. But we have big problems that's facing the communities that we live in and the nation that we're a part of. Some of the big problems that, that we're facing, just to name a, a few, broken families, fatherlessness, divorce, poverty, substance abuse, incarceration to levels that the world's never seen, homelessness, domestic abuse, gang violence, racism, teenage pregnancy, human trafficking, etc., etc., etc. Out of all those things I just listed, who do you think pays the biggest price for all of those? It's the kids, children. They pay the biggest price and they didn't cause them and they have zero ability on their own to do anything about it. They're the victims. They're the real victims. They're helpless. Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4 says, Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Speak on that in a couple weeks. Rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. We're called to defend the defenseless and love and father the fatherless. And I've got four incredible kids. My oldest boy's name is Elijah and out of all of our kids uh, he is the most compassionate one. That's his well, he's just he's sensitive um, and he's compassionate, like, to everything. He's 10. And I uh, haven't seen, I've never met anybody quite like him. And uh, he's compassionate to all things. Uh, people, all sorts of people, it doesn't matter who. He's compassionate, sees the good in everybody. And animals. Now, I'm not talking, like, just puppies and kitties. And some of you are strange and even have compassion, like, towards chickens and... Any really weird ones out there, like, you know, oh, PETA, yeah, it's what's for dinner, is what I say. And uh, he's compassionate towards all animals, and it freaks me out. When we live out kind of way off the beaten path, and uh, to get to our house, you have to go down this dirt road for quite a ways. And one night we're driving home, it's just me and him. And, He's sitting there telling me, like, if you want stories, you just need to hang out with Elijah. He'll tell you something. He'll make you convinced that he knows what he's talking about. And uh, so I'm just driving along, and we come around this curve, and then, you know, maybe 100 foot up ahead in the headlights, there was a possum going across the road. And you thought that my son got shot or something. He screams, Dad, don't you dare hit that possum. Oh, okay. I wasn't. Dad, I, I saw you, you were going to hit the possum. I'm sitting there, first of all, I wasn't. And second of all, what difference does it make? Nasty little things. <laughs> he goes into this huge explanation. And I'll, I'll give my son this much credit. If he's interested in something, he does the research on it. He says, well, actually, Dad, um, possums, they just get a bad rap in our country. He says, they, they really are. Do you know that they're the only marsupials in the whatever hemisphere and all this kind of stuff? And they're really a fascinating creature. And I think we should probably advocate for them to be on the endangered species list. I was like, I look at him like, let me talk to your dad. You're, you're insane, you know? Um, but he was just sitting there, he was explaining to me that uh, they're like marsupials or something, they keep them in the past. So that's probably mama, and you were about to murder a mama and all of her babies. I'm like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> ease up, kid. And, and man, he's just super, like, he was concerned, he's compassionate. And um, why do we want to come to the rescue of animals? Well, because we look at them as helpless and, and needy. Literally, that's the only reason we rescue them. And whatever you want to do with that, that that's fine. I'm not 
not to sound, at the risk of sounding crazy here, I think saving the wells is okay, but uh, perfectly great because, and I would be all for you doing that because I know that you're putting uh, children in front of the needs of animals, right? You're doing that. Because that's what you're called to do, right? And uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're sponsoring kids. You, you're getting involved. You're volunteering. You're you're adopting, you're fostering, you're doing all those things, and then, you know, you can help out the animals. I know that you guys are, are doing that. You're putting children above puppies, and I commend you for that. This message is not, it's going to be very difficult for me that it's not a, a guilt trip thing. I don't want you to ever walk away from anything and saying, oh, I feel guilty. Never mistake, never, uh, never cheapen God's conviction for personal guilt. Don't exchange that. It's a lie. It's cheap. Um, I think what the deal is, is I get it, too. I've, I get a lot of people don't get involved for a number of reasons. Don't have time. You're doing good just to pay your own bills. Can't have another mouth to feed. Um, I get all that. There's enough family stress going on. I, I get it, and that's fine. People that say I don't have time to care, and that's fine. You you can keep on believing, and, and maybe that's the, your reality. But continue in your reality from this point forward, of, with the full understanding that these kids have a very special place in the heart of God. Jesus said when he comes, uh, he, was, he was very clear. He says, I must be about my father's business. And whenever we're shown the heart of the father, we should, ha- as followers of Christ, we should take on looking more and more like Jesus every single day. And we should be concerned about the things that concern God. Because God cares about these kids more than we could possibly ever comprehend and he's calling his church to care as well. If you want to know about God, it, it describes one of God's characteristics in, in Scripture in Psalm 68. It says that God's a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. This is God, whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. Places the lonely in families. I love this passage of scripture. It's so true. One of the things we say around here is you you can't do life alone. God never intended for your life to be done alone. Period. And um, whenever I think of a lot of things, a lot of people, and a lot of you have come into church today, and maybe you're feeling lonely and abandoned and left out and forgotten and overlooked, and you're in the right place. But I have... There's very few things that I can think of um, that makes me hurt for the word loneliness than a child that doesn't have parents to go home to. Some of them have been separated from the only siblings they've ever had. Um... They don't have dad to pray with them and tell them about the love of a father. They don't have moms to make them meals and teach them all the things about life. And that's, that's loneliness. And uh, God's desire is to place the lonely in, in families. And as a church, we're called to help. I, I thank God, honestly, that we're I mean, I think, we, I think we're an awesome church, I, this one personally. I love my church family. I'm going to tell you a personal story about our life. Um, but it's not just a story about me and Kenzie. It's a story about a lot of people in this church. Um, we have four children. We have Kendall. She's our oldest. She's, she's beautiful and intelligent. And we have Elijah. loves possums. Um, <laughs> 
And then we have Charlie, which he's just full of life and energy, and um, he's going he's gonna to do great things. And then we have Titus. He's our, our youngest. He's uh, just turned five, and he's very much a charmer. And uh, he's got lots of girlfriends, and you say, who are they? Well, they're probably you if you're asking that. And so, um, incredible. So we have four awesome kids, and uh, only three of them are biological. Charlie, our, our middle son, our life, whenever he was eight months old, became very interrupted in, to our life. And it wasn't just a, the day started off as any other day, and my wife and I were called out to go pray with a, a, a woman who was down on her luck and needed some help. And so we, that's all we go over there for. We go over there to pray with her, and then right there in the corner of this little room, and when I say little room, it, it was a rough environment, guys. There was a crib over there with this little Charlie. He sticks his big old eyes and all this, and he kind of had a smile, and, and uh, we just immediately go. Long story short, we went to pray with a woman, and we came home that day with the sun. And through a series of events. I mean, it was somebody in this church that introduced us to the situation. It was, um, I thank God that we've had so much help and so much care and so much love from this family of church people all along the ways. And um, you all mean so much to us. You really do. And we've had so many challenges with Charlie. Whenever you have these kids out there, some of them have been exposed to substance abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Can I tell you something? Emotional abuse. I didn't know what it was like to have a child that I, I thought, eight months old, perfect. I didn't know the challenges of, a, of an eight month old child that had never been really held. Didn't know. And time and time again, can I tell you what? I can't express how much strain it's put on our family, how much it's cost us resource-wise, relation-wise, um, property-wise. <laughs> uh, the challenges are profound, they're real. So whenever you, there was never a question, though, in our minds, because sometimes we go, um, I'm too busy, or I can't, or it's just not me. And I'm not, this is not a message to make anybody feel guilty. I'm not saying that everybody's called to, to go out and adopt, and I'm not saying everybody's called to go out and open up their homes to foster care. There's so many different ways that you can be involved. Um, it's incredible. Another part of the story we're committed to Charlie he's my son and uh, so part of his journey has been to where we really needed he had to go for a short amount of time to what they call level 4 residential care to help some of his needs and intensive therapy and uh, so he's back home now and we're, we're praising God for that but while I was up there, here's what broke my heart the most out of any, everything. We went up for therapy one day, and this therapist, she tells me there's about 40 to 50 kids up there. And I just noticed every time that we would go in that nobody else, like, Charlie seemed like to be the only one that was getting, like, where are all these other kids' parents? And they told me, he said, Charlie's the only one here with a mom and dad. And can I tell you something? That just, it messed with me so much. These kids are facing extraordinary challenges that they really had nothing to do with them. I went home that day, and I sat at my desk, at my office, at my house, and I wept. 
bitterly for these kids that have nobody to defend them, to hug them, to let them know it's going to be all right. And I won't get into a lot of things, but it's not a good spot even where they're at. And we have to do something. We're called to do something. We can't go out and save all the kids, all the, but we can, we can have compassion on the ones that God puts in our lives. We're living in, a, in an environment around here. I'm proud of this church. They step up so big, and we've got a lot of foster families in here and a lot of respite care providers. And, and listen, it's just the, the fact that back in the kids' zone, what would it look like if I can't do all this, but I can't invest an hour of my time into sharing the love of Christ into a kid that's maybe coming from a very bad situation. Maybe I can go in there and encourage that young man who's always being put down or abused or never complimented on anything. He walking around with his head low because he doesn't have a father in his life to tell him that he's great and he's going to do wonderful things and there's more in him than he's ever dreamed or imagined and to put your hope in Jesus and he will take care of the rest and, and always be there for the need. No, because he's always been put down. Maybe he needs you in his life to sit there and go, I think you're incredible. I think you're brilliant. Maybe it's the young girl back there that doesn't feel loved, that doesn't feel like she's pretty and maybe she's been exposed to sexual abuse. Maybe she feels objectified at a tender young age because her mom's been objectified by men all the time in and out of the home. She doesn't realize that she's beautiful, valuable, chosen, a daughter of the Most High Queen. They're a queen of the Most High God. They're incredible. They're beautiful. They need a hug and let them know that. What if the, the, this church was marked by out of all the areas you could serve and give that there was actually a waiting period for you to get back to the kids because there were so many people wanting to invest in the future? Wouldn't that be incredible? I thank God for this church. Y'all saved My family walked with us through hard times. I thank God they, because there's a lot of times that we feel all alone. But God places lonely in families, and it's His design. That's His church. We're not here to fix each other's problems, but we are here to share each other's burdens. The hope that we have in Christ is that we. Uh, besides the eternal hope, is that we don't have to do this life alone. And I, uh, I think, there's so many areas, there's so many things wrong with this world, right? But if we're going to call ourselves Christians and followers of Christ, We can't. This is, this is not a suggestion. This is a mandate on our lives that we care, that we invest. Um, it's, and I'll make you two promises. Whenever you step out, and you choose to invest your life, your, your relationship, your resources, your home, you're everything into, a, into the life of a child, I promise you this, it'll be harder than anything you ever dreamed. A lot of people say, I, I can't get involved because uh, I can't do foster care. Because one of these days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get attached to that kid and, and then they're gonna be reunited somewhere else or moved from my home and it's gonna, gonna, gonna rip my heart out. Can I tell you something? It'll rip the guts out of your soul. You'll weep bitterly. It'll be so hard. Choose to adopt. The strains that you never even dreamed of before. If you have a savior complex, you need to get rid of it. 
We need a fathered and mothered generation. You're not there to rescue puppies. You're there to invest in the future. How many future presidents could we have had? Future astronauts, future teachers, Nobel Peace Prize winners. Those, how many would have come out of the 60 million? But now we have what, what we're left with is just as big of an epidemic, I think. We have got to invest in the future. We have got to care about those who can't take care of themselves. And it's going to hurt, and it's going to cost you more than you ever plan on paying. This journey has almost ripped my family apart at times. I'm being honest. I'm not exaggerating. Caused great financial strain. Huge emotional pain. And it's not just me and Kinsey. We've... It's a lot of people are involved. I've got three other children that are involved too. So it'll hurt way more than you ever dream. That's my first promise. And the second promise is it's worth every bit of it. It's worth every single bit of it. Charlie told me the other day, he says he's starting to, he's in transition right now to back he's at home. He's, and uh, he says, Daddy, you mean I can stay home forever? Dang right, boy. Yeah. It's going to be hard. But we're not alone. We're, in, we're involved with a great church family. That can help out. And all that little kid was saying was, you promise you're going to love me forever? Always and forever, buddy. I'll never forget the, the day that we were actually in front of a, a judge and that he took our last name. Changed me. There's something special about it. It'll change you when you invest your life in some form, way, just invest your life. It'll change you for the better, I promise you. Um, oh, sorry. I love this. In Ephesians 1.5, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us. We're all adopted. If you're in Christ, you're adopted. He just... He decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. I love this part. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. I thank God that no matter how, what my set of baggage was and issues I have and unique set of circumstances I had, Let me tell you something. If there was ever somebody that needed to be saved, thank God he says, I'll adopt you. Come on. I'll call you my own. Come on. You know why? Because he says you're worth it. And you're lonely. I've got a plan for you and I've got a family to place you in. That's the story of us as Christians, if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, that's the story that could be yours. And I just think that uh, the church should really lead the way in caring for these kids. So whether or not it's volunteering out of school to become a lunch pal. Kids are not numbers. They each have a name. They each have a face. And they each have a unique story that the days of us going, I don't want to get involved because it might hurt. It's going to hurt. Toughen up. Get involved. If you're trying to protect yourself from pain, you'll never experience life to any meaningful degree. Don't be scared to love. 
Don't be scared to invest. Don't. Just don't. I'm looking for some men. I, I, I dream of the day that there's more men serving in our kids zone than there are women. That'd be incredible. Just high five these kids. Let them know that Jesus loves them, that you love them, that you care about them, and you want to invest. Say, so, well, I'd probably screw something up. Can I promise you're going to screw something up? You're a dude, first of all. Uh, but don't be scared. All these kids want, just like Charlie says, may I stay home forever? I just want to be loved. They're worth it. They're worth it. And we have got to lead the way in it. Bow your heads. Let's pray.